All right, uh, with that, I want to start off with some kind of important business this morning. We've got something serious to attend to. I want to do kind of an unofficial poll here to gather some data. So uh, really, uh, one of the best stories, I think, of the Christmas season, right, outside of kind of the real, more so just kind of the cultural stories that exist around it, is the story of the Grinch who stole Christmas, one of my favorites. And this exists in a few different versions. And so what I'm looking to do today is together, collectively, try and determine what is the greatest of all of the Grinch stories. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to throw up a picture of each movie up on the screen. And when you see your favorite go up there, uh, if you could give some cheers, some claps, whatever it might be. I know we've got the kids in the room, so I'm expecting some enthusiasm here. And uh, through that, we'll determine what is the greatest Grinch of all. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and jump into it now. The first one is uh, right here. All right, pretty good. Pretty good. Okay, this is the most recent, most colorful version, the Benedict Cumberbatch voice version of the Grinch, right? By all accounts, a good rendition. All right, now second, we have... Oh, there we go. All right, that's what I love to hear. By all accounts, a cinematic masterpiece, right? Okay. All right. Now, now third and final for the traditionalists. Oh my. <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good. I don't know. I don't know which one to go with. I'm going to have to, I mean, I'll go with the one I like the best. Well, I think it was the middle one for sure. Jim Carrey. So, <laughs> all right. But I have to say, uh, whichever version happens to be your favorite in our household, we love all things Grinch, so much so that we've actually instituted kind of a new tradition. We'll see how long it sticks, where every Thanksgiving, we've done this the past two years now, uh, we have what's called a Grinchathon, where we read the book, and then we watch all three movies over the course of the day, and uh, we welcome in the Christmas season, not just by indulging in turkey and mashed potatoes and stuffing and all of that, but also in all things Grinch. And so it's been, it's been a good time. And one of the interesting things I think about doing that, of seeing all of the different versions and the adaptations just in a single day, is that you get a really good sense of what's different about each story and what are some of the things that hold true? What are some of the things that stay the same regardless of which version? And to that end, one of the things that stays the same in every single version of the story uh, is the, the catalyst for what finally brings about change in the Grinch. Right, the thing that finally brings about some transformation within him, the thing that helps his heart to grow. And it's that on Christmas morning, when he's climbed all the way up to the top of Mount Crumpet, or his dog has pulled him up there, and he's looking down over the town of Whoville, and he's waiting for all of the Who's to wake up and find that everything they love about Christmas has been stolen, right? So to wake up and find that there are no presents under the tree, that there uh, is no tree at all, there are no stockings, no decorations, no hot chocolate, no eggnog, no food at all, right? No nothing, that Christmas in all of its entirety has been stolen. He's waiting for them to wake up to this reality and to respond in misery. And yet what actually happens as he's looking down from the top of Mount Crumpet is all of the who's wake up to find that Christmas has been stolen and yet still they go out into the center of the town and they hold hands and they sing. As an expression of joy, they sing. And it's that, more than anything else, him encountering the presence and the reality of joy in the midst of circumstances where it does not make sense, that changes him. Encountering joy in the midst of circumstances where it does not belong is what finally brings about a transformation within the heart and the life of the Grinch. And I think that's kind of an important thing to reckon with because it's true, not just of the Grinch story and all of its adaptations, but I think that speaks to something that's true about joy in general, that it is an incredibly powerful thing, which is why I'm excited for us to take these next four weeks through this Christmas season, through this season of Advent leading up to Christmas to walk through uh, and really unpack this biblical concept of joy and really look at what is the role that it should play within our lives and, and what is joy and how do we lean into it. 
And so to that end, I think one kind of helpful thing in getting into this series would be to just sort of lay out what is the definition of joy? What are we talking about when we're discussing joy? And so this is kind of a basic definition coming from Miriam Webster. Uh, that is joy is a feeling of great happiness. Joy is a feeling of great happiness. Now, I know that some of you are probably already thinking in your minds, wait, hold on a minute. I've always heard that joy and happiness are two different things, right? That these are two separate things. So how can you be saying that these are the same, that these are synonymous? And to that end, I think I would agree that there is some, there's quite a bit of value to nuancing. What do we mean in particular when we're talking about joy? Right. What are we talking about from a biblical perspective? But even with that being said, I do think that in some ways the division between joy and happiness has been greatly exaggerated and that the two are far more synonymous than what we have sometimes been led to believe. And that's actually the reason why I'm so excited about this series, because I think for some of us, we've been led to kind of understand God and even feel about God in the sense that he has almost no concern whatsoever for our joy, right? That that the level and measure of happiness that marks our lives, that our joy is something that God could really care less about. Some will even throw out the, the slogan that God doesn't care about your happiness. He cares about your holiness, As if the two aren't related. And so to this end, if I could kind of condense the sermon down into just a single idea that I want to really unpack together this morning, it would be this, that God wants you to be joyous. That God wants you to be joyous. And even as an extension of our definition, you could say that God desires for your happiness, right? And we'll unpack that together today as well as across the next several weeks together, which I'm looking forward to. And uh, for today, though, in particular, we have three different sections we're going to work through as we explore this idea. So we've got, this is our table of contents. We have a joyous father, the wrong routes, and the real source. A joyous father, the wrong route, and the real source. That's what we're going with today. And really the first thing I'm trying to do is just kind of establish that what I'm claiming here, that God wants you to be joyous, is something the Bible actually teaches. It's something the Bible communicates. And so to that end, if you happen to have a Bible with you, would you go ahead and grab that, open up to the book of Matthew chapter 7. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, but you'd like one, you should be able to find one nearby. If you're in the stadium seating in the back, there should be one underneath uh, your seat. Or if you're down here in the ground, there should be one underneath the seat in front of you. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7. And uh, that's what we'll be looking at today, starting at verse 7, looking through verses 11 together. And we'll have the verses up on the screen as well, so you should be able to track along just fine. All right, Matthew chapter 7. So just some context real quick before we read this. This is one section out of a larger speech that's known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's a speech that Jesus himself gave, recorded in Matthew from chapters 5 to 7. And even in the very beginning of the speech, there's something called the Beatitudes. It's his introduction where he's got these repeating phrases uh, that have the same beginning, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. And what's interesting is if you take the Greek word in the original language that's translated blessed, Uh, you could actually just as easily translate it happy, right? Happy are the poor in spirit, happy are those who mourn, happy are the meek. Meaning, right from the very beginning of this speech, Jesus is already addressing the theme of happiness. And, And I would contend that even later on here in this passage, he brings it up again and touches on it just in a slightly more subtle way. Uh, but with that, let's jump into this together now. Matthew chapter seven, starting in verse seven together. All right, Jesus is saying, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And to the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. All right, so Jesus here, he's talking about prayer. 
he's presenting a teaching on prayer. And if you notice, there's some repetition that he uses within this passage. He repeats the same set of three words twice in the exact same order, saying, ask, seek, knock, ask, seek, knock, right? And the point here isn't that he's describing three different types of prayer in which we're kind of interacting with God, but but more so, these are synonymous ways of expressing that part of our prayer life should involve coming to God to lift up specific concrete requests that we should ask God for things in prayer. And the repetition is there just to stress that this is in fact the point, that this is something that we should do, right? And he's saying that we should do this because God responds to our prayer, right? Those who ask, it will be given. To those who uh, seek, they will find. And to those who knock, it will be open, right? So God responds to our prayer. So Jesus really opens with the application here, saying we should pray in this way. And then he follows this up with sort of a two-step argument explaining why this is the case, why we should do this. And so let's just kind of track through these steps together. First one comes in verse 9. And it says, Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? All right, so he, he starts off by kind of throwing out a couple of rhetorical questions here, addressing the parents in the crowd, saying, when, you're, <clears throat> when your child asks you for food, what do you do? Right? You give them <clears throat> food. Right? That's what you do in the case that it's a legitimate request. Right? To, to clarify, this isn't kind of talking about the situation where uh, a kid has eaten two bites of their lunch, said they're not hungry, and 20 minutes later they're asking for fruit snacks. Right? This isn't that kind of a situation. This is an expression of real uh, legitimate need, of, of a physical need. And when your child expresses that need, you respond by giving them food. Right? And why? Because you love them, right? Because you care about them, because you have a concern for their well-being. And I think one of the things that's kind of interesting about this is that there's kind of this basic instinct that parents have, almost every parent has towards their children, where there's kind of nuances to how this gets broken down. But fundamentally, what pretty much every parent wants for their child is for them to be happy, for their children to be happy. And, and I think that part of it, that love that leads you to that desire is what leads us to kind of provide when there is a legitimate need that's expressed, right? And so, uh, Jesus, the first step in the argument is establishing that this is in fact how human parent child relationships work, right? Now, second, the second step, he builds on this even further. And this is what he says there, verse 11. If you then, who are evil, Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? All right, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Right. Now, I think what's kind of funny about this is that he doesn't even give an argument for uh, claiming that everyone listening to him is evil. He just kind of accepts that, uh, kind of states it as a baseline fact and moves on, which I think might have something to do with the fact that he is talking to parents. Because if there's any relationship in life that will reveal to yourself that you are a flawed individual, it's the parent-child relationship, right? You, you can't be in that for very long without finding that there are some things that aren't right with you. And so he establishes that and then moves on to draw this comparison, right? Saying that if even you, as flawed as you are, love your child and want to meet your child's needs and you want the best for them, then how much more is this true of God and his own children, right? How much more? And, and the comparison is essentially saying Jesus is inviting us to understand God in our relationship with God through this lens of a parent-child relationship. That all of the good traits that exist between a human parent and a child, right, in the best relationship, all of the love and the care and the concern and all the things that are good about that, he's saying how much more are those qualities existent and do they shape the relationship between God and his own children, right, between God and you and I. And to be sure, in this passage, there's a direct application here to prayer, 
Right? Jesus is saying that this understanding should really shape the way that we pray, our confidence in our prayer, and even the consistency with which we approach God in prayer, specifically to make concrete requests, right? To, when we have a need for something, to bring that before God. And to do so with confidence because of this kind of relationship that we have with Him. Right? That, that's kind of the direct application from the passage. But even with that, I think there's a broader point to be gleaned from this. And it's that if you go back to that idea that, that at almost a basic uh, kind of instinctual level, parents have this love for their children, this care and concern for them, that I think you could break down to the idea that, that the one thing parents want for their children most of all is for them to be happy. Right? And granted, we want that in a variety of different ways, right? There are nuances that actually kind of shape the way that we parent differently because we have different understandings of what will bring that about for them, of what will lead them to that kind of a life. And that shapes the way that we parent. But even removing those differences, I think it's pretty easy to say that the target is the same. That the goal for all of us as parents, if we are in that role, is the same. And if that's true, then how much more is it true of our perfect heavenly father? Or how much more? Which is why I think it's actually very biblical to say that God not only desires for you to be joyous, but that he may be far more concerned with your joy than even you are. God wants you to be joyous. Now, as soon as you accept that, as soon as you acknowledge that and see that as something that's true, I think there's a question that arises pretty naturally. And it's that, okay, so if God wants this for me, if God desires for me to be happy and to have a life marked more by joy than by anything else, and if I myself desire this, then why isn't it happening? Right? If we both want this, then how can this possibly not be the case? And I would just say that that is an excellent question. I want to move into the second point now and unpack that a little bit more together. Right? The wrong routes. The wrong routes. So the Westminster Shorter Catechism is... Uh, this important document from church history that it basically is a list of questions and answers that are trying to provide a basic understanding of what it is to follow Jesus and kind of basic truths of Christianity, right, in the Bible. And the very first question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism is this, all right, what is the chief end of man? What is the primary purpose of humanity? What are we created and intended for? And the answer is, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. To have an experience of joy, right? That granted is tied directly to God, but to have an experience of joy that lasts forever. Right? And I mention this because I think sometimes this desire for joy and for happiness is something that drives and really is one of the primary motivators in our lives. And I think what this shows us is that even from the documents of church history, we see that this isn't necessarily a bad thing, that not everything about this is terrible. However, oftentimes the way we go about it is we take the part about enjoying, uh, about joy forever, and we kind of scrap the rest and craft our own routes for pursuing it. Right? We pursue joy in so many of the wrong ways. And I just kind of want to tease out a couple of these, right? The, the first one being uh, what the Bible calls idolatry. Right? That idolatry, which just to give a, a simple definition would be that it's treating something other than God as if it's the most important thing in life. Idolatry is treating something other than God as if it's the most important thing in life. And this really comes from uh, you see it, first off, you see it in the books of Exodus and in Deuteronomy coming from the Ten Commandments that God gave to the people of Israel. The Ten Commandments being a summary of the whole law that he gave to the people of Israel to live according to, so that in their way of life they would reveal to the nations around them the nature of God and what God was like. And so people would be drawn to him, right, and brought into a relationship with him. And of these Ten Commandments, the very first one says... You shall have no other gods before me. You shall treat nothing else in this life 
as if it's more important than me. You shall have no idols. And the thing is, that law is given for protection. Right? That law is given for their good and for our good as well. The, the trouble is, I think we fall into this route of pursuing joy through the route of idolatry because we're surrounded by so many different stories that are seeking to persuade us that this is in fact the correct way. And, and just to kind of tease out a couple of them, one would be uh, that I think career success. That we believe that if we can attain the career success that we're looking for, that there will be this lasting sense of joy and satisfaction that we can get from that. And so growing up, I think what that leads us to do is to kind of pick some career that feels especially meaningful to that. And very quickly, we begin to tie our identity to that in a very close-knit and connected way. And so we determine that I want to be a nurse, or I want to be a lawyer, or I want to work in finance, or whatever it happens to be, and we go to school to pursue that thing and then we try and get a job in it and we launch out into that career and one of two things happens either we fall short and it's crushing to us because we had based our entire identity on reaching this thing or we get it only to find that it's in no way able to deliver on what we were looking for Right, that, that may be some parts of it that are, feel meaningful. There may be some parts that are fulfilling. But we get out into the midst of it and we find that by no means was this able to provide the lasting joy and happiness that we were looking for because the idol is never able to deliver. Right? And so that's one big one, career success. I think another big one is the idea of romance. And uh, you could even connect it to marriage, right? That, um, and this is just one example among many. I understand that I'm treading on some dangerous territory here, uh, but the Hallmark Channel, right? This is, this, <laughs> this is one example among many where so many of the movies, especially around Christmas time, they follow this same basic plot, right? Where a career oriented single from the city visits her hometown over the holidays. And while she does, she bumps into an old flame or even a new love interest that at first she finds incredibly annoying and frustrating. But circumstances push them together. And as they spend time together, slowly, a romance sparks. The potential for a relationship begins to develop as their feelings grow. But then all of a sudden, she finds her career back in the city comes knocking. And she's forced to choose between her high profile life in the city right, and love and romance in this small town. And every single time they choose love, right? Every single time, because the message of these stories is that that true love, right? Marriage and romance, that this is where lasting joy and happiness is found, right? That, that it's not in career success. But it's in romance. But the thing is, I think what's kind of funny about it is that these kind of light romance films and even the romantic comedy genre as a whole, if you notice, it always stops at the wedding. Right? It never, sometimes it doesn't even get there, but it never goes past. Because as soon as it does, it has moved into a different genre altogether. Right? <laughs> and I think what that tells us is that um, you know, marriage is a good and a wonderful and a beautiful thing, but it cannot fix you. Uh, that romance cannot make you whole and that it cannot deliver to you the lasting joy and happiness that you're believing that it will. Because the idol can never deliver. I, and so I think that really is one of the primary ways that we try and pursue a lasting joy and happiness outside of God through these different versions of idolatry. Uh, but then another route that I think is connected to this, that there's a relationship between them, is really the route of religion. Right? Religion being trying to earn God's love and approval through keeping rules and practices. Right? Trying to uh, earn God's love and approval through keeping rules and practices. And I think sometimes the way this works is that we're brought up 
in kind of a religious upbringing, a home where we're exposed to this and we're brought into this relationship with God where we understand him to be almost like our elementary school principal, right? This person that is just huge and slightly terrifying and anytime they're around, you just try and keep all the rules and stay as far off their radar as you can, right? And so you try and be good. You try and keep all of the rules and and do things as well as you can, but just like elementary school as in life, I think what we find very quickly is that we're not all that great at following rules. Right? We're not all that great at keeping all of the practices because we're not all that great at religion. And every time we mess up, it plunges us into this feeling of guilt and a lot of times shame and fear. And so we vow that we'll just do better, that we'll work harder, we'll never mess up in this way again, only to find that we mess up in that way again, which plunges us deeper into the same exact feelings. And the cycle keeps going and so on and so forth as we move deeper and deeper and deeper into these feelings. And I think what that shows us when anyone who has been in a cycle like this for any amount of time will tell you is that religion uh, cannot coexist with joy because it absolutely strangles it, right? It's impossible to retain any sense of joy while trying to follow the route of religion. And so the way that these two kind of work together across a person's life is I think, I think what can be true for a lot of people is we're brought up in a religious home and we find very quickly that There's no joy to be found there, right? And so when we get to the point where we're moving out of our parents' home, whether we're going to college or whatever it might be, we're ready to cast off the shackles of religion and find uh, joy and happiness and whatever we believe will bring that to us. And so we throw ourselves into that, right? Say we go to college, we pick that career that we want, we pursue it, we uh, graduate, and then we... Uh, you know, you get launched and established in your career. You know, maybe you enter into a relationship, you get engaged, you get married, and you have some kids. And then you find that you get at the other end of this season of life where there's always this mile marker, this significant marker, just a little ways down the road, right? From graduation to your first job to marriage to kids. And you think, if I just get on the other side of this, then I'll, then I'll be good, right? Until you finally get past all of it and you realize there are no other significant milestones just down the road. There are no more carrots to pursue and you're left feeling with this incredible sense of emptiness and this lack of meaning and purpose in your life and this frustrating absence of joy. Right? And life feels, on the one hand, very... Maybe boring would be a way to describe it. And on the other, just disappointing. And so what do you do when you find yourself in that place? What do you turn to? I think on the one hand, we either double down on idolatry and we choose some other thing to pursue. Whether we throw ourselves into our careers even further or we buy a Harley or not that there's anything wrong with motorcycles or we, you know, you have an affair, something like that. Or you go back to the only other route that you've ever known. You go back to your roots. You go back to religion. Thinking, maybe if I go back, I'll find something here that I just missed when I was growing up. Maybe there's something more to be had here that I just never was able to see when I was a kid. And so you go back to religion only to find that there really is nothing else there. I thought there's still no joy to be found. And if this in any way resonates with your own story and your own experience at all, I think what this shows to us is that uh, for all of our desire and the time and the attention and the energy that we have given to pursuing joy in this life, we have almost no idea whatsoever how to actually attain it. It's like it's always slipping through our fingers and we can never just hold on. But thankfully, I'm here to tell you that there is a third route. There is another option. There is another way. So let's move into our third and final point now that I want to unpack this together. The real source. The real source. 
All right, so in the book of Philippians, one of the books in the New Testament, it's actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul, and he wrote to the church that was located in the Roman city of Philippi, where they were experiencing some persecution, they were suffering. And so Paul, because they're friends of his, he writes this letter to them, really to encourage them and to teach them in the midst of these circumstances. And one of the things you can see very quickly, even just from uh, reading through it, you can read it in probably five, ten minutes, it's a pretty short letter, it only has four chapters. And and one of the prominent themes that you see arising, even just from a cursory read, is that joy is one of the most dominant themes throughout the book and throughout the letter. As the words joy and rejoice occur 16 times in a letter that is not that long. It only has four chapters, meaning whatever it is that Paul is trying to communicate to them in the midst of their circumstances, joy has to be a significant part of it. He's trying to say something about joy. And if I was to kind of condense it down into just one single idea, it would be God wants you to be joyous. Right? He wants you to be joyous. I think that's what he's seeking to communicate to them. And so he's saying it's not that we don't experience the full range of emotions throughout this life. Right? There are things that give rise to all kinds of feelings, to sadness, to fear, to anger, right? to, to the entire and complete range. And yet, no matter what you're feeling, he's saying to them, I want you to rejoice always as an act of worship. To always rejoice. And I get that that may sound like a difficult thing to say, right? You say, how, how dare he say such a thing to them? How, how dare he tell them? He doesn't know what they're going through. But actually, the point is stressed even further in the letter when you take into account the fact that Paul himself was writing while he was in prison. And so even in the writing of this letter, he is modeling for them what it looks like to rejoice in the midst of circumstances where joy should not belong. Right? Where by every account, it seems it should not be there. And I think if there's anything to kind of take away from that, it's that when it comes to joy, it very rarely operates in a way that we expect it to. That so often we assume certain things about how to attain joy and the ways that it works and what brings it about. And, and I think if there's anything to be gleaned from Philippians, it's that we have almost no understanding of how joy actually comes about because it is so often not tied at all to our immediate circumstances. It is so much less tied to our immediate circumstances than it is to our relationship with God. That our joy is so much less tied to our immediate circumstances than it is to our relationship with God. Right, meaning, whatever it is that you're looking for to provide you with joy, right? Maybe it's a home. Right? Maybe it's the promotion, right? Maybe it's getting into the specific college, right? Whatever it is. Not that these aren't good things, they are great things and they're gifts from God, but they cannot deliver on what you're looking for them to deliver. Because joy is a byproduct of our relationship with God. Joy comes about as a byproduct as we tend to our relationship with God. Right, which again, this is something that we're going to unpack in a whole lot more detail over the next several weeks. And I'm excited to walk through this together. But just kind of giving a cursory overview. Uh, we see this talked about in a couple different places in the Bible. One of them being Galatians 5, where Paul, same guy who wrote Philippians, he wrote this letter as well. And in chapter 5, verses 22-23, he says this, that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. Right, the second one in the list is joy. Then he goes on to say all the rest. And the point here, the context is he's saying that you don't uh, achieve these things. You, you don't kind of become a person marked by these just by trying harder to have them. Right? You can't work up joy within you. You can't work up goodness and gentleness and peace. But these are the things that naturally arise as we tend to our relationship with God. That when we do that, these arise as naturally out of us as berries do from a bush and trees do from an apple. 
Right, and so we see it there, and then we also see it uh, in another place. John chapter 15, another biblical author, uses slightly different language, this language of abiding, to describe the same exact thing, saying, as the Father, this is, this is him recording Jesus' words to the disciples, saying, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Right? Meaning, right, if we abide in his love, if we remain in it, if we soak and saturate ourselves in his love, if we walk through this life as the continual recipients of his love and allow that to be the thing more than anything else that shapes us, and that shapes our lives and that fuels our devotion to God. His joy will be in us and our joy will be full. Meaning the first step to living the life that's marked by joy that God desires for you is not pursuing the thing that you think will bring that. It's not following the the route of idolatry to career success or marriage or a home or whatever it might be and neither is it the path of religion where you have to earn God's approval so he will grant you with joy uh, by keeping all of the rules uh, but the first step uh, to walking in the life of joy that God desires is actually not to do anything uh, it's just simply to trust in Jesus and to believe the message of the gospel, All right? That God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus right, to, to live the perfect life that you and I could not live, to die on the cross in our place and for our sins and then to rise from the grave in victory so that you could be brought into the relationship with God that you were created for forever. And so that you could walk through this life as the recipient of God's love continually. Right? We see this actually, I'll just call out one more verse, John 3, 16. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And to make this just in some more personal terms. For God so loved you. Right? For God so loved you. You, as an individual, right, with a name and a face and a story that he knows fully and completely in every detail. He loved you so much that he sent his son to die in your place so that you could be brought into a relationship with him forever. So that you could walk in the fullness of joy forever. And I hope by now you're getting the point, right? That, that it is a very biblical thing to say that God wants you to be joyous. And we're going to take the next several weeks to unpack this further and look at it from a few different angles. Uh, but as we get ready to close here, let me just say this, right? That uh, going back to the Grinch at the beginning, across all of the different versions and the adaptations and everything that's different uh, from one movie to the next, the one thing, uh, one of the things that holds true is the catalyst, right? The thing that brings about change within his heart. And it's when he encounters the presence of joy in the midst of circumstances where he does not expect it, right? Where it doesn't seem to make sense, where it seems that joy should not be. And I would say that the circumstances of this life are often such that they do not naturally give way to joy and happiness, right? This is not an easy world to live in. And yet, as those who have trusted in Jesus, we always have reason to walk in a deep and abiding love as we rejoice as an act of worship and as an act of obedience in the love that we have received in the gospel. Right? And as we do, as we do that and walk in the fullness of joy that he offers to us, I think the point that I'm trying to make from the Grinch is that people notice that. Right? People see that. 
Because when someone encounters joy in the midst of circumstances where it seems like it should not be, that does something. So I'm looking forward to the next few weeks together. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we do thank you for your word. Uh, We thank you that um, joy is something that you have spoken about much within uh, the Bible, that that you've given us... um, actually much teaching around this concept. And we thank you that it's something that comes about as our relationship with you uh, and that you yourself, through your sacrifice on the cross, we were given the ability to have that relationship and to walk in that relationship and to, um, and to do so in response to the love that you have poured out for us. And so as a community, I pray that you would be with us over these next couple of weeks as we continue to unpack this series together, that you would open our eyes to understand your word better, to see beautiful things within it. But even beyond understanding, would you help us to walk by the Spirit? Would you help us to abide? And would you help us to live in such a way, in obedience, that leads our lives to be marked by the fullness of joy that you offer to us? And so we thank you, we praise you. In your precious name, amen.